Brandon Tay, Managing Director, Chief Executive, um, Guanchong Bahad, Main Market Company, Bursa Malaysia, number four cocoa grinding company in the world by way of volumes, right? Um, obviously, you're one of the biggest players in the world, um, Brandon. And I want to get, you know, spend the session discussing the principles and, and, and the ethos behind the way you, you've run your business and grown your business over the last a couple of decades. Let's start at the, at the point where you had a, a family business into which you were, you know, kind of born into, right? And then there was, a, there was a dispute in those days, many, many years ago, after which you had to find your way forward and to, to build a business in a way from scratch, right? Can you start at that point and tell me what it was like in those days? And, and then from there, let's go in. I'm not the, I'm a world number four in the term of uh, cocoa bean grinding. We are the number one in Malaysia, the uh, nationwide in terms of size, why we are the number one as well. Yes, of course, we have also ventured into uh, Indonesia. Um, we also venture into uh, Ivory Coast. We also have a factory in uh, Germany, USA and UK. And of course, I, I, I like the business because uh, it has been uh, uh, built in our, our blood for such a long time. It's kind of interesting for me to recall back uh, quite a long time ago when we were actually in the, in the university where my uncle and my father, they all started, you know, to... Why not you using something like a cocoa bean around in, 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 in the town where we have more uh, close by to Tangka in Malaysia. Uh, basically, the place was full of uh, cocoa bean around and the beans are actually quite abundant and, and dealing with cash business. That is what was uh, my uncle and my father said, why not we do something about it? and we were thinking of hey, how do we do it, how do I do it, that kind of thing. So ever since we came back about 1990, and we actually uh, tried to enlarge it because we were in a, a small town in, in Moa, in Palajawa, in fact, and always running out in terms of uh, shortage of uh, power, and always break down. And we only did about one or two containers a month. Pretty small size, about 1,000 ton a year. So once we came back from US University, we actually enlarged it to make the existing uh, the places of factory we have from uh, palm oil. We converted it into the cocoa bean grinding. So we actually do it in the Pasigudan because they are closer to the port. And that is where the beauty is because uh, the power is more uh, stabilized and, and continuous around. So that's why we started. I think we was actually kind of a, a, a venture in a, in a sense because, you know, we have a kind of opportunity. Even though I wasn't really involved very straightforward just to, the, to the, this bean grinding. And, and oh, I wasn't really joined until 1995 and 1996. But all the while I participate in the board meeting here and there, just to learn here and there uh, how, it, how actually I was in charge in a sense. Yes, like everybody else, when you grow big in terms of uh, uh, business-wise, uh, families start to have dispute. And I have, uh, fortunately I have a, a big family. We have uh, six uncles together. My father was number three. And we have a sep first separation from the first uncle after he ever since he passed away. And um, so we were joining two, three, four, five, and six. And later on, we split again from five and six. So we only joined for three and three, two, three, four. Then later we split again, it become only two and three. That was that. How was started in a sense of split, separation in terms of family. If you're talking about asking me whether separation is good or bad, definitely I learned. We, we were civilized people. We don't really fight. We actually talk and we discuss. Uncle Wise, uh, pretty good. We lay out the floor, lay out the plan. Okay, where should you take whatsoever? Without involving much with the legal, we actually separate in a way. Okay, you take this section, take this section, the kind of section. So we're actually quite easy for us to separate. But even, I actually quite lucky that I involve all this separation. Asking me whether it's good or bad, definitely I'm saying it right now, yes, because I experienced for that. And I know that it's difficult in terms of separation because sometimes you have feelings or whatever. But we are lucky that uncles and uh, and they all, we actually still mix around, come back to actually in charge for the business. Like everybody else, um, we all start small, very, very small. In fact, we were the smallest in, our, in Malaysia. The time we were back in 1990, we have a huge mortgage. Uh, the mortgage are just so big that we, we have to be, really give up everything, all your resources to put in. So we kind of worry, I kind of say, oh, how do I sleep? How do I get a stress? In terms of all this kind of mortgage, mortgage a huge uh, uh, owing to the bank. And we also sing and say, hey, what happens if you put everything in one basket? What happens if this industry is not good for me? And so how do I go about? And if anything wrong, how my family going to be? So that was the, and I've tried to find a scapegoat, I've tried to find an alibi for me to really go into it. What should I do? Of course, luckily, we look at the, 
our potential customers, people like Nestle, people like Hershey, people like Monterey, people like Cadbury at the time they still have, they are huge. And we look at them, hey, look, they need us, even though they are not our customer yet. I'm sure that they won't go down, you know. So I have this kind of alibi, say, look, we show hand, go for it. Even though we are very tiny, and we are owing so much money. Uh, that was then. But unfortunately, uh, uh, my cousin, you know, uh, my fourth uh, uh, cousin, in fact, he was actually the leader at the time. He was actually asking to, for us to really direct ourselves to, to merge with uh, uh, big guys in uh, New York and Brazil and uh, Switzerland, where the big guys are. And, and I went to see them, I went to, to really discuss with them in Switzerland and to see the New York, see how they perform. And eventually I said, well, this is a different culture. And I believe that, you know, um, we are rather too small to really merge or really join venture with them. Because we'll be left nothing. I mean, I believe in size. Definitely, I want my size to be bigger. Then we play a different role. But at the time, we think, why are you so slow? And why are you only merge people that you can't even control? You can't, you can't even say what you want to do. So we actually give way. But my, my cousin actually insists to do it. So that was a trigger that we split. That was the last split we have from the fourth uncle. And we could be by all that because of our also, you know, like everybody else, um, before that family uh, don't really hold in terms of proper uh, legal term in terms of voting. So I was the one really asking, say, why not we have a proper voting system? So we say we proper voting. We have three families together. We have an odd number. Then we vote whoever's supposed to be in. When we split, uh, that was kind of, uh, I would think that was turned around or we called myself a nightmare in a sense of, I start to worry. I've never been in the leader in the, in the sense. I have to be head to head to, with many competitions, particularly my cousin, who is actually the leader at the time. I have panic. I can't sleep for a long time. Uh, you might not uh, believe how I went through. When my, the factory we have and our office we have is basically unbearable in the sense that it's very difficult for people to attract, for me to attract people to come in to work for me. So I was really worried, you know, particularly we also you know, have so much number of uh, debt and, and you know that along two years from now that my cousin, the factory is coming up and then I have, don't know how to do about it and I have no capable people around. Suddenly you are pushed to be the leader, so you make it grow. Uh, that, uh, that was the time I grow. Why not? I do it slowly. What's wrong with whatever current system I have? So I put additional capacity inside. I guess it was a luck that suddenly the demand is very good and the ratio in terms of cocoa pricing was very much positive and helping me around. So we make tons of money from them. Even though we invested in for an additional quantity of double out the capacity, but actually we make money in less than two years. I'm not sure what is given by God, <laughs> the kind of feeling. I, I believe in the, you, you, you take the leap. You, you eventually in the some way that you think that it is taking risk, but it based on calculated risk that I think should go for it. And of course, the, uh, that was a bit lucky. When I recall back, should I do it again? I have to because my quantity is too small, but I have no resources to really expand. So how do I do about? So that's where he had to come around to ask the bank to support. And, 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 and luckily, bank was really, really uh, supporting me. And that was then I grew in the first step I have ever seen the split. So what were the lessons from that time for you, Brendan? The splits, you know, the veto of the acquisition or the merger, um, those days when you're alone and you felt like crying. What were some of those lessons for you from that time, from that era? I will definitely wish I, I, I can join Vistage at the time because apparently there wasn't any experience, neither for my father, neither for my uncle, neither anybody I can ask for. Not even before listing I have. I list myself in the 2005. In terms of experience-wise, I have no experience. My, my, my close to the next of kin or so ever have no experience. The time was really basically, you was discussing with your own, the peer, the, whatever we have in, in my management team. I bring them along and discuss about it. Uh, that was then. But if, if I really have a vestige along the way, I'm sure that I can ask them to really advise me what to do next. Where's the value there for you? I definitely uh, value, um, you know, he have a pool of people who are experienced, who likely to be a lot bigger, the size that I have. So I always know that there is a, a group of uh, people who I can trust on, can rely on to seek for information, to seek for advice that if I do that, what would that be based on the opinion? How would I be able, if I make this thing, what is their opinion will be? So definitely it will be a plus rather than you struggle yourself. You think you're not sure whether should I do this? 
should I do that? So that's an importance of an ecosystem behind you, um, fellow advisors. They're kind of sounding boards. La. So, yes, so that's I something was talking about if, let's say, I have it before, but I wasn't really aware of uh, a Vistage until 02006, I met up in uh, Richard Wong in Malacca. I so wasn't aware of that before. This is after you listed the business? Yes. Because you listed in 2005. In 2005. Right. Yeah. So talk about that time because for you, um, size is important, right? So yes. some of your principles, you talk about size being important, you talk about quality being co important, yes. consistency being important. Yes. Then now you say you got factories in Ivory Coast, you got yes. factories in Germany, yes. of course in Johor as well. Yes. Right? So, so talk about your business principles in that respect. Okay, of course, if let's say from the customer point of view, if you only have one factory, if anything's negative in terms of the place you have, in terms of running short of energy, running short of labor, running short of port issue, running short of because of political issue, always have some issue. So as a customer point of view, they don't want you to be just alone, particularly the size are big. You yourself only can supply to them uh, just the tips of the iceberg for them. So you are rather too small in that sense. If you are not big enough, people like Nestle, people like MNC people, they don't feel secure for them to sue you in that kind consistency of sense. Consistency of supply. La. In that sense, consistency of supply. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, that definitely right in a good, good term. But I think because if you are not big enough, in, in terms of your management team, in terms of the overall production monitoring system, in terms of quality wise, you might not be consistency. Because you don't have that good system to really monitor, to, to make sure that your, your, your quality is always consistency. It takes time to, to, to actually build out the size. And, and of course you have to be uh, carefully think where should you go grow in the sense of that you, you, you can grow the size. You also have to implement your system. You also have to make sure that your management is there to make sure that the operation system is really matched to the time of the environment, the time of the places you have to grow the, the size of you have. So it's, it's very naturally that they don't trust you. You can run out anytime, particularly in our, in our, in our business here. In where our business, in the cocoa business here, we're selling at least one and a half year, or one year at least, in that sense, forward selling. And people don't trust you, Hey, look, yeah, how? They won't, buy forward. they won't buy forward at all. Yeah. Uh, so this is natural in our industry. So we need to sell forward. We need to be naturally the size of the big. So how do you go from reasonably small in those days to quite big? So that the transition in scale, how do you make it happen? I don't want to give to, to the point is fit. You know, I was kind of lucky in the sense that Malaysia, uh, you were used to be the highest uh, in terms of production uh, cocoa bean around about 250,000 tons one year. In the time we were, we were running something like 10,000 ton, you know, I got only a fraction of the, uh, uh, the, the supply from Malaysia. But in terms of uh, growing in a sense that, when I reached up to uh, year 2000, my size was over 48,000 ton. But Malaysia's cocoa bean supply is getting less and less and less. From 250,000 ton down to recently less than 2,000 ton. And it's like naturally they convert to put it in palm oil because it's easier to take care, care of. So cocoa bean, was getting less and less. That was also part of my excuse. Say, why if I not move, if I not stay out from my comfort zone, I would die eventually. And I was lucky that I saw all the while I've been from 1997 onward. I've been taking a lot of cocoa bean import from Indonesia. So there was then say, oh look, we have to do it. We we have to move ourselves. The time in Indonesia is about 500,000 ton. Indonesia the bean is also getting less right now. Even though they are still, I I take up almost more than the 60% of the whole total Indonesia uh, uh, production yearly. In a small, uh, in a 130,000 ton of uh, capacity in, my, in Batam. But it's getting less and less. It's less than uh, 200,000 ton right now. So three years ago, I moved myself to put it, put it in the Ivory Coast. Africa? Uh, in Africa. Um, you're part of the value chain. Uh. Yes. But some, some manufacturing company like say Top Glove, like, just for, you know, for, for an example, right? Mm -hmm. They chose to go and start to grow rubber themselves, right? To go upstream, they control the upstream. Did you never want to do that? I can't do it because uh, every hectare can comfortably, one hectare can produce only half a ton in cocoa bean production a year. So based on what I have of 270,000 tons capacity or run actual run capacity what I have at the moment, I will naturally need 280,000 <laughs> hectare. A lot, a and lot. imagine how many workers you need it. Yeah. So better don't play that game. Naturally, you don't do it. So that's what also, I mean, uh, the market cocoa board in Malaysia uh, also asking me, say, hey, what can we do something about it? I'm also part of the director there. And I say, hey, look, we, we should encourage the plant but they say, hey, 
you say only but you don't yourself do it no so you're asking me i will do it if they give me the land just for a show uh, some sort of um, a synergy because when i doing the planting myself i can have a, a sustainability program to right. teach farmer to really do something good about it. So this is interesting from a kind of like a business strategy perspective, right? Because sometimes you do something because you want to do it, and sometimes you do something because you're forced to do it. Yes. So situation forces you to look elsewhere for additional yes. supply of cocoa yes. beans. Yeah. First you went to Indonesia, mm -hmm. then now you're going to Africa because Indonesia yes. now is dwindling, right? Yes. Uh, so in a way, your expansion, as you say, has been driven by situation yes. and circumstances, right? right? But, but don't get me wrong because you have to do your part also a lot of competitors don't do it because it's look moving yourself to Indonesia is always out from the comfort zone people have been to Indonesia you think that wow have not been there you think that's difficult but of course been there they visit well it shouldn't be there because a lot of issue yes we have plenty of issue there roll the dice try is that the principle take the risk take the relief take the opportunity is what I always believe in because like in, in equity when people throw, you buy. When people buy, you throw. That would be the best. Yeah, yeah. Like people, a lot of people go, go the reverse yeah, way. Yeah. But unfortunately, I'm fortunate in the, in the sense that I think that my customers are very, very strong. You know, you look at Nestle, they are, need to grow every year. I mean, you do not have, a, uh, have the, 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 the so-called financial report. You see the way they grow. You see the, the way they move forward. So you will uh, be sure that they will be around. And you will be sure that if you are not growing, somebody else will grow. And you will be a diff you will be diminished diminished like what it used to be in Malaysia. Malaysia used to be over thirteen factory. Right now it's only eleven three. So in a, in a sense, you have no choice to grow. Otherwise, you get eaten up and you die. Luckily, it was protected in the on the whole whole only five million tons of cocoa bean a year. But luckily, it's not like um, palm oil, where you, you 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 if the price is good, you put more fertilizer in, then they can grow a lot more than you can imagine. Not in cocoa. Cocoa is basically a little bit difficult to grow that fast in terms of, in terms of chain reaction, even though no matter how much you put the fertilizer in, that kind of feeling, because they need a lot of labor. That's good and bad. It's good means that they, they, they have this growing rate slow. And a lot of people wouldn't want to come in. They think that it's too slow in terms of margin wise. Big guys say, hey, look, this is peanut. Why should I grow such, a, uh, such an industry where the growing rate is so small? But luckily, we are in a, in a business set. I grow from 50,000 to 100,000 to 150, right now to almost 270, to over 270,000 tons. Of course, I venture into the downstream to in making chocolate right now. And that's chocolate for, 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 for Mars and Nestle and Hershey to really take my chocolate and uh, put it in their own labeling. The size I have small and I have a chance to grow big. Yeah. And, 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 and of course, I, I, I went through a lot of experience. I threw a lot of uh, bad experience in the sense of the big guys that they sue you for a quality issue, blah, blah, blah. So, but if you are not big enough, you, you basically cannot afford for them to have any hiccup. So size matters? Uh, size matters in that sense. Yeah. Size matters is also, it helps us so-called publishing ourselves in the sense that, hey, I heard about you, so I can buy from you in a very much comfortable way. So in terms of the business challenges, like, huh? Right. Brandon, because you're, you're a global business, right? So there's domestic issues which you have to contend with, then there's global issues which you've got to contend with. War on Russia, yeah. you know, you've got your yeah. interest rates, yes. you've got your raw material supply, yes. you've also got ESG. So the whole value chain has to be more sustainable, yeah, which of course you're part of the value chain. Yes. Nestle have to be a big yeah. part of that as well. Um, but you don't seem particul particularly stressed out. So it seems as if you, you've sussed it all out, right? <laughs> not, not really. Yeah, of course, uh, like everybody else, uh, we need uh, our own people, our own, own uh, ESCO member, our own team people, my own colleague. I'm lucky to have a lot of uh, more than 15, 20 years, good guy, smart guy, a lot more smarter than me to really uh, believe in me. To so grow the principle there is to hire wisely. Yeah, yeah. That, that is, is really, I, I actually appreciate. People come and go, but a lot of my key person still stay put. I was really blessed that some of the key person still stick around and they're still growing very much. And with the experience, because we are focusing and even though interest is higher, but if the interest is higher, uh, your price of um, uh, uh, raw material or your price of machinery or facility will be higher eventually. Everybody eventually will be higher in terms of cost wise. But they need to build also. They need to do. When they do it, it's also more, more expensive. Same thing. So, but like what I mentioned before, this is a long term business. This is always uh, a lot more forward selling. People believe, people want to believe here that you will be around after they have a contract with you. Especially if you have a almost two years contract with them ahead. So my factory, our factories, 
over than five of them right now, have been in terms of Google Bing running. Has been always forward selling, 24 hour, hours, 365 running, non-stop. Okay, so to cap the conversation, right, I'm going to let you have the opportunity to give three pieces of advice to the entrepreneur, right? Number one, two and three. What's your advice to the entrepreneur that wants to make it big? Every industry is definitely have their own issue, have their own problem, has their own advantage and disadvantages. When you think that you want to be in your business or in your in industry, you think that this industry allow you to expand, allow you to have potential to grow. Once you make up your mind, you stick with it. That's definitely is a prior before anything else. So stay the cost. Stay the cost is definitely one thing, but but of course, almost all the business is the same. You have to take care of every aspect here and there. You do not create something that is so different and so out of moon that you, you think that is, is really one, one, one method or one, one, one way that you can kill all the competition. I don't believe in that kind of thing. I don't believe in that kind of magic. I believe in staying the course with your own human being in terms of key person, the management monitoring system. You do your work. You, 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 you make sure that every corner you're doing well. You, you grow if there's opportunity, take the grow. And when it grow, the problem came. The problem will come and you need to solve it. You need to solve it quickly in that sense. So every problem is solved already, then you are allowed to have in place or implement the system to make it bigger and a more uh, confident way or more efficient way that you, you, you allow you to grow bigger. It is no magic, definitely. You need to really put in a cost put in a, in a core where you focus on it. You really have to be using your own people. You have a group of people discuss together in the team building way to make sure you stay in the core. Don't change. It takes time to realize, to accomplish the, 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 the project or the way that you want to do. It, it, it had to allow them to have nurture the way, a lot of time for them to really hitch it uh, to do the thing. What's your second piece of advice from the entrepreneur? You've said, Stay focused, right, and make small changes. That's the one piece of advice. Another one? I did mention about take the leap in a sense. Yeah, take the risk. Take the leap. It take the risk. Take the calculated risk. Don't rush for something that you have no confidence on yeah. And of course, I did actually mention take time also. Yeah. Time definitely is important to let the thing mature. Yeah. But of course, like everybody else, I believe also take turns. Yeah. Take turns in, in certain things that you listen to people. I used to be are very much rushing. I want to rush, 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 you know. And I always very arrogant say, yeah, your idea doesn't work. You are too young to all this kind of thing. So make a collective decision. So I take turn to listen to them. And is there one piece of advice to, to rule it all? Is there one golden rule of advice you would give? There's no magic. I mean, I seriously don't want you to give me the idea saying that given from God, given from you are lucky. I do really believe in that. I actually believe in, 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 in hard work. The magic word is to grow the business. I still say there's no magic. Stay in the course, you always have good opportunity come along. Somebody may give way, so you, you, you have a chance to really uh, take over them in the sense of to grow up your business. Yeah, these are some of the best and most long-lasting evergreen principles, Brendan. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.